Let's take a tour and look for unique parts and talk to some car nuts on the way. I'm always amazed at the things you can find in an event like this. I usually try to pick up a part or two while I'm out wandering around. Today, I'm in search of a hood for a GTO I've been working on. Unfortunately, the producer, who really is a slave driver and don't believe anything to the contrary, insisted on finishing the taping for this show before he turned me loose in this part's jungle. Even so, I was confident I could find a hood for my goat. Hey, how you doing? All right. Looks like you got a little bit of everything here. Yeah, a little bit of everything. Actually, it looks like a lot of everything yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been coming to the show? Seven, eight years. We got, uh, I see a, a 71 Mustang Dash, a 65 Vet hood. Yeah, I'm how about a, I need a, I need a hood for a 67 GTO. You got one? No. Oh, man. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I could probably build a, a GTO out of the stuff here. Hi there. Hi, what are you looking for today? I'm looking for a hood for a 67 GTO. You got oh, one? Oh, no, this is all the metal we have. Do you think maybe you can modify one of these for oh, a hood? a 67 Fender. I don't think I can make it into a no, hood. 66. No, no. no. no well, We had uh, two hoods earlier and we sold out. Story of my life. Yep. Well, Should've thanks a lot. I'll keep working. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Good luck. Hey, hey, excuse me. Do you have a hood for a 67 GTO? <laughs> all right, thanks, thanks. We'll keep our search going. Okay, so this one right here, you're looking for the grommet down in here. While you're looking for that one, you take care of this fellow here. Hi, can I help you? Boy, I hope so. Do you have the hood for a 67 GTO? Oh, I just got one out back. I'll take it. Excellent. I knew I could find it at Carlisle. Well, he's getting that. Let's talk to the two men behind these awesome events here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Bill, in honor of the 100th year of the automobile, you guys have the America's Motoring Milestones tent behind you here that premieres cars all the way from 1896 up to 1996. But one of these classics is actually yours, and it's this stunning 54 Kaiser Darren. Tell me a little bit about it, and show me some of the unique features. Well, Dennis, I guess the most unique features, feature on the car is the fact that it has pocket doors. It has a sliding door that, that disappears right into the fender instead of having a normal door that swings out. Only car I think that's ever done that. That's correct. This is a, a Kaiser. What was it built on? Well, Kaiser made the Henry J, which was their economy car. It's on a regular Henry J chassis, but it does have the Willys engine for more performance. Well, it's very rare. How did you come across this car? Well, it's, it's a rather unique story for the fact that the gentleman that bought this car bought it as a demonstrator from the dealership. It had 5,000 miles on when he bought it. He drove it right up till 1984 when I bought the car. It has 49,000 original miles on it, and it was his only car. Joining me now is Chip Miller, co-owner of Carlisle Productions, along with Bill Miller. Uh, Chip, this is a heck of an office. I mean, not everybody has got a Callaway Corvette. Uh, this is my kind of working environment. It's perfect for a Corvette, nut, that's for sure. And uh, I never look at the, this as work. What I do is fun. Well, you are a Corvette nut. You've got another Callaway Speedster out in the garage, and we'll, we'll get to that on another episode. I hope tell so. Me, <laughs> tell me more about the, the Carlisle event and how this got going. Yeah, boy, it makes me feel old when I tell this story because it goes back about 22 years ago. Bill and I were walking through a swap meet, and uh, I had a car for sale. It happened to be a Corvette, a 54 Corvette. And uh, it wasn't a real popular thing there. They said, you know, you can't have a car that new, if you'd believe, a 1954 Corvette being new in 1973. Uh, I said to Bill, well, why don't we just start something for people with cars like this, interests like ours? And Basically, that was the seed that started the whole thing. You can find just about everything here. I found it at Carlisle. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Welcome back to Carlisle, Pennsylvania and summer at Carlisle. This huge flea market and car corral has something to offer every car enthusiast and explains why these events are so well attended. You can find parts for everything from pre-war classics to muscle cars. Which brings us to this week's feature, the development of the 810 Cord. This pre-war classic was arguably the most unique American automobile of its time. Many of the great automotive stories in America are a combination of skill and luck. The story of the 810 Cord is no exception. The men behind it embodied both a competitive drive and a fierce originality. But these men were not without luck. 
The 810 would never have hit the road without the help of two more unusual elements, kitchen cabinets and a presidential request. In the early days of the auto industry, what we call the pioneering era, you had a lot of luxury cars being built by what are called independents, separate from the Detroit companies. These constituted only one half of one percent of the car buying market, which is a very small target to aim at for your marketing, but that's what this company was doing. By the mid-1920s, the Auburn Automobile Company of Auburn, Indiana was facing serious financial problems. One of the great entrepreneurs of his time, Eret Labancord, assumed the helm of Auburn in 1924 and made it thrive at a time when many other independents were failing. With his success came the acquisition of many auto-related companies, including Duesenberg and Lycoming. In 1929, he established the Cord Corporation, which would draw on its collective engineering talents to create one of E.L. Cord's firsts. Cord wanted to bring out the first front-wheel drive production car, the first front-drive car to come from a factory. And he did so in 1929 when he came out with the famous model L29 Cord. And this was America's first front-wheel drive car. Others came shortly afterward, but the Cord was the first. The L29 ceased production at the end of 1931, partly because of its price and partly because the purchasing public wasn't educated about the benefits of front-wheel drive. Nevertheless, the L29 made the name Cord synonymous with front-wheel drive. In the early 1930s, the Depression began to take its toll on Auburn and Duesenberg sales. In an effort to create a more affordable luxury car, Harold Ames, appointed president of Duesenberg by E.L. Cord, recruited Gordon Burig, a designer whose talent had pulled him between GM and Duesenberg four times in six years. They came up with the idea of a baby-sized Duesenberg, which they in fact named the Baby Duesenberg. And in 1933 they had plans of building this car that would look totally different and new in design, different from the past Duesenbergs. But the Baby Ducey wouldn't make it past the prototype stage. Both Harold Ames and Gordon Burig were transferred to Auburn in early 1934 to try and revive that rapidly dying company. Working with Auburn President Roy Faulkner, they were given the responsibility of designing an entirely new car. Here in Auburn, Burig's Baby Ducey body would become married with a V8 Lycoming engine and the front-wheel drive transmission that had evolved from the L29 Cord. When he came here to Auburn in 1934, he instituted for the very first time the process of using clay models as a preliminary to building prototype bodies for cars. Throughout 1934, the engineering and design departments at Auburn worked on the new car's features. Included would be a unit body, an independent suspension for an unusually smooth ride, and because of the front-wheel drive, it would be among the first cars to utilize constant velocity joints. The Baby Duesenberg's headlight design was altered slightly, moving the side mount to the center of the fender. The car doors on each side would be hinged on a center pillar, which actually allowed a front door and its opposing side rear door to be stamped from the same die. In November of 1934, when all the elements were in place for the production of a prototype, the Cord Corporation's board of directors shelved the entire project. The company, with a net loss in 1934 of almost $4 million, did not have the capital to produce and market an entirely new car. And here is where the kitchen cabinets and the President of the United States play their part in the Cord story. Because of falling auto production, one of the Auburn automobile plants located in Connersville, Indiana, had been utilized to stamp out steel kitchen cabinets. Now this resulted in a guaranteed million dollar production deal by mid-1935. Due to the depression, Franklin Roosevelt requested that the Automobile Manufacturers of America move its scheduled auto show up from January of 1936 to November of 1935. The president's hope was to try anything that might spark greater consumer interest in purchasing cars. Roy Faulkner saw these two events as an opportunity to get the 810 cord off the ground. Utilizing the money from the cabinet sales and knowing that barely seven months was all the time left to produce a car for the upcoming auto show, 
Faulkner authorized the production of the prototype chords. When the board of directors met again in July, they gave approval to production based on photographs of the original clay model, not knowing that the actual prototypes were about to be road tested in a drive to E.L. Cords estate in California. With less than four months before the New York Auto Show, the crew at Auburn had an enormous task in front of it to get the 810 ready for the 1936 model year. The rule at that time with the New York Auto Show was that you couldn't show a car at the show unless you had 100 actual, tangible, finished cars ready at your factory. After Gordon Burek's design was approved, they worked day and night till they were all exhausted, getting as many cars ready as they could. They never did get 100 cars built to comply with the rule, but they fudged through and they had cars ready to take to New York for the end of 1935. The car did create the sensation that they hoped for. It was uh, like a spaceship that dropped down from above because it looked so different and so much more modern than other cars. So the orders began to flood in and the company knew they couldn't keep up. So they had to just take the orders and they made up little bronze models, miniature models of the cord, mounted on marble bases to give to each of the prospective customers while waiting for delivery of their car. For the 1937 model year, leftover 810s were renumbered and renamed 812s. The 810 cord always looked smoother than it performed. Problems persisted with the transmission, as did problems with vapor lock and overheating during its 18-month production schedule. The Cord Corporation ceased production in 1937, having created a total of only 5,000 810s and 812s. But its 75 first time ever features guaranteed its place in automotive history. It really is a full uh, dash. It's got a full set of instruments. It's also attractively set with the engine, engine turn dash. Another uh, interesting feature of the car is the uh, pre-selector. It's an electric uh, shift mechanism where you put it into the next gear after you shift, you put it into the next gear, and it doesn't shift until you push the clutch in. Gordon was very, um, everything he did was uh, something that hadn't been done before. The cord car, of course, he called that his baby. I mean, just like a man and wife have their baby, it was his. It wasn't anybody else's, it had never been done before. It was different. It was, it was all his idea, so he just called it his baby. Well, that wraps up another show. Our thanks to the great car enthusiasts here at the Summer Carlisle Collector Car Flea Market and Corral.